Thank you so much for coming. Um, welcome to the National Leather Collection. Uh, my name's uh, Matthew McCormack from the University here in Northampton and I've helped to uh, kind of organise these events over the course of the week. Uh, this event is part of the National Being Human Festival of the Humanities which is taking place across uh, 50 towns and cities across the UK over the course of this fortnight. Uh, so Being Human is the only national festival dedicated to celebrating research across the humanities. So his, we've, this week we've had history, we've uh, had uh, archaeology, we've heard about the history of leather tanning, leather technology, all of those kinds of things. And uh, this year the theme is origins and endings. And um, I think we're both thinking about origins this week, aren't we? That's what most of the talks have focused on. Um, we're going to think about origins in its probably most literal sense where leather's concerned in this talk today. There's also a pop-up exhibition about origins and endings here, so do check that out. Um, this festival is run by the School of Advanced Study, University of London, in partnership with Arts and Humanities Research Council and the British Academy. Um, if I have one favour to ask you, please, uh, before you go, it would be very grateful if you could fill out one of the evaluation sheets so that we can find out how to make the festival even better next year. So if you could uh, do those and hand them in on, on the way, it would be very great. Could I ask a favour of you as well? Yes, go on. Can we turn that lollipop bit up, Charles? We can't see anything. Okay, but we tilt it a bit, but we, yeah, do, need to, enough, yeah. we do need to yes. illuminate the speaker a bit so that he can be visible. <laughs> <laughs> it's, rather, it's rather dull today. Okay, so um, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Professor Matthew Collins. He's a Professor of Paleoproteomics. Correct at both Cambridge University and the Copenhagen Natural History Museum. Um, he's going to tell us today about the uh, Beast Craft Project. Yeah. And uh, take it away, Matthew. Right, thanks very much. So I'm going to talk about a project which is just about to start. We'll start on the 1st of December. And it's a project where we're looking to try and bring, to merge together historians, scientists, and conservators to actually look at a very, very common object which is parchment, medieval parchment primarily, but not in its very traditional way. So what happened was, um, there was a meeting at the Bodmin Library in Oxford last year. This is a picture from that meeting, where the hand is actually sampling this wonderful object, which is a gloss luke. Uh, this is a book <coughs> held in uh, private collections. And what a gloss luke means is the Gospel of Luke, but you have the main text in the central column, and on either side of the main text, there's commentaries on the various passages in the Bible. Now, this book is unusual because it's really got a scabby binding on it. Uh, what's really interesting about that is it's actually got the original binding on it, um, which is very rare. This book is probably dating to about 1160. It was produced in Canterbury. And so we've got a bunch of scholars together who can understand this book, in its various um, um, <coughs> ways. And we kind of explored, if we all got together, what might we learn about these objects? And here, this person is sampling, these are wormholes. And they're actually sampling for thrass inside the wormholes to see if they can actually extract DNA of the woodworm that is eating the oak boards on this book. Anyway, so this meeting, um, which I helped coordinate, got lots of attention. <coughs> this is an article in the magazine, a very important science magazine. Um, and as a consequence of that, we were very lucky uh, to receive funding to sort of really explore this in, in great detail. We, up until this meeting, we've been struggling to find anyone that wanted to fund it. Um, and it's not really such an old idea because he, back in 1950, um, there was a study, a scholar looking at the idea that we could actually understand books as objects, uh, look at their pathology and their diseases, and then uh, in 1999, uh, another scholar looking at the idea that you could look at book bindings as kind of archaeological <coughs> stories. So I'm an archaeologist, but you could look at the book bindings sort of as, a, as a dig, you could dig into them. Anyway, so we're very fortunate to got funding, and so this is where it's supposed to start in December. Me, and what's nice about this project is that almost everyone associated with the project join the project because they wanted to. I didn't have to recruit anybody to this project, we had to recruit somebody in the end. Um, but these are all people that found out about this kind of really weird world of studying 
animal skins not as medieval objects of parchment, but as animals themselves. So we have a, a medic who was doing medicinal proteomics in Barcelona, um, and she said, I want to use my skills in proteomics, the study of proteins, to actually look at old protein objects, serotonin. We had Matthew Teasdale, who was a geneticist, and he works on sheep genetics at Trinity College Dublin, so he is now joining the project. We have Simon Hickenbotham, and he's a mathematician, and he likes imaging things, and so his interest has been in imaging the surface of objects. Ilyji Vnuchnek, he's actually a parchment maker. So he has been trained as a medieval bookbinder and now has quite a big thing in the world of showing how parchment can be made. So he'll run courses on that. Um, Elodie Levesque, she is a French bookbinder and so she works on historical bookbinding. Annelise Benoit is a veterinarian, a veterinarian who got really interested in diseases in the past. So she wanted to, she transitioned out of veterinary science and in, into archaeology. Uh, and J. Malcolm Davis was a textile specialist. So she actually works on, she has her own company, and her company looks at the ways in which we dressed in particularly Tudor times. So a really kind of eclectic mix of people who all got together to join this project, with, which we call Beasts to Craft. And the idea about this is, Everyone thinks about medieval books and, and, and legal documents and archival documents as the object with the text that's written on it. So there's been a lot of work doing so-called digitization to image these objects so we can record the text. And so now as a medieval scholar, you can dial up and you can look at the collections in the Getty in Los Angeles or in uh, Beinecke in, in Yale. Um, and so you can look at these different objects remotely. But what you don't have is what you have all around here which is the material culture, the artifacts, the actual process of production. And what we wanted to do is focus on the animals and the people that turn those animals into, into parchment. And so the reason it's a great time to do this is this is a very busy figure, I'm sorry about that, but here we have years, publication years here. And then we have these graphs. <coughs> what these graphs are showing is the number of thousands, this is over a thousand now, of um, human genomes. And you probably know that we've now started to sequence the human genome. The idea being that if you sequence all the DNA inside of you, we might somehow understand you better. We're not quite sure that's really true yet. But what's remarkable about these is that, notice the text of about 2013, so it's very recent. These are all genomes of people who died a very long time ago. These are all archaeological. So the fact that we've actually got over a thousand archaeological ancient genomes of people is telling you now that there's been a big explosion in the amount of data. Um, and that's come about using uh, this technology of ancient DNA sequencing, so it's not very clear. Um, and alongside that, where you this is where you take a bone sample, you fragment the DNA up, or you put it to a big machine, you get lots of fragments, you join them together and you work out what the thing is. Uh, there's been another explosion and that's in studying the things that DNA make, the thing that DNA encodes called proteins. So what you do the same thing, you take the proteins, you smash them into small bits, put them in another machine, it's also the same color, it's like blue and gray is a really hot color. And then you, and then you get a, a sequence from those, and again, you can reassemble the proteins. So they're very, very simple approaches, similar approaches. And they've been driven by the idea of personalized medicine. The idea that in the future, you won't be treated as a generic human being, people actually understand more about you as an individual and try and treat you as that individual. But to do that, it's extremely expensive because you have to characterize the you. And so these technologies are driving down the cost of that for modern medicine. And all that we're doing is jumping on the back of that technology and using it for ourselves. And so what I'm gonna talk about mainly today is use, depending on how bored you get, we might talk about handling and conservation, but we'll talk about production. So this is Ergi. He is in the, in the, in the sun in Los Angeles. Uh, this was, I think, was two years ago now. And you can see behind, reflected in the, in the glass there, a whole bunch of medieval historians and scholars. And, the, and he was running a course on how you turn animal skins into books. And so here he is with his Ergi Dean. And he is essentially a self-taught parchment maker. 
I mean, other than Cowley's uh, Newport Pike, which is down the road, there are very, very few commercial parking producers left. And so most of the people engaged in park construction are kind of working it out for themselves now. We've lost a lot of the traditional craft skills, and Irji is one of them. Um, and what I want to do is go to this, which is the, the last really clear description of how parchment was made. It was made by someone who then was um, quite elderly, Saxel, but she did it as her Master of Science in 1954 at the University of Leeds in the Department of Lower Industries. And what she did is she actually went to a parchment production site and actually just and, and went through and documented the way that parchment was made. And now people like Irigi Zuchinek, who's based in Copenhagen, or his colleague Jesse Meyer, who's based in New York, and they are now reading all the old medieval texts to see if they can recapitulate the methods that were used to make parchment. And so this, I'm now what I've done is I've taken the three pages from her her master's thesis, and we're going to walk through the process of parchment production. So she went to um, Hitchin, um, to Messrs. Russell of Hitchin, and she documented the way that they, in the middle of the 1950s, were making parchment. And so the first thing that she says is that parchment is made from nested sheep, um, fresh salted from the slaughter. And so Sarah Fidiment, who remember was the medic working on medicinal proteomics, she was seeing a heart disease. What she did, and you'll see on the videos around, they're still running, is a video about her work. She came up with a, a technology, we might, we might sample um, the shoat skin afterwards. Um, she came up with a method which is very, very simple for sample <coughs> parchment. Now you can imagine, um, I, I guess the background to the story comes about because I had a, another veterinarian, Simon McGrory, and he was really interested um, in organic farming methods and trying to uh, explore that through the lens of archaeology. So saying how, how, before we had modern agricultural practices, were animals being raised? And he was particularly interested in the Iron Age period and the Viking period. And so he did a study where we contacted colleagues from the University of Cardiff, and they had been digging a site in Scotland for uh, five years, and the site was on a chalk, uh, chalk sand, um, or sort of sea cell sand. So the bone preservation was extremely good. So he got lots and lots, many, many thousands of bones. And what he said was, could you um, sample for me a range of uh, cattle bones? And he wanted cattle jaws, because he wanted to work out how old the animals were when they were being killed. And he wanted to compare that with organic farming practices. Anyway, by the end of his project, he had managed to amass a grand total of 29 cattle jaws. And he did his analysis on Iron Age and Viking practices, and he thought that the Iron Age people were probably raising their, their cattle for milk, and the Vikings for meat, probably. But with 29 cattle jaws, he couldn't be very much. Mm -hmm. So I went to the library, the Borthwick Library in New York, and I saw these archival documents, and there are kilometers of shelves of these things, because this is where the archives of this York's legal documents were held. And every single one of those documents is an animal skin. So we've gone from having 29 jaws after five years of digging on a site in Scotland to just turning up the local archive, and here you've got thousands and thousands of, of dead <coughs> jaws, all with a date neatly written on them, which is quite convenient, because they're legal documents. So we then went to march into the archive, we kind of talked to the, the head archivist, and said, yes, this sounds like a great project, with a large pair of scissors. And we said, um, can we sample, please? And they no, no, you can't sample at all. <laughs> and so poor old Sarah, who had come, you know, she, she quit her, uh, she got her PhD in, 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 heart, in, heart, in heart disease. She comes to York, and she says, I can't, my project, I can't do it. Because they won't let me sample. So what do I do? So we sat there and I puzzled, scratched our heads. We said, well, the only thing we can think to do is they're conserving those parchments, some of them. And when they're conserving them, they're interacting with the surface, they're using smoke sponges, they're using these PVC erasers, they're using various um, tissues. Just analyze all of the things they throw in the bin because they've been in contact with the parchment. And maybe, just maybe, one of them will actually have some record on it and we can use. And luckily, it, just, it turned out that these white PVC erasers, you might remember them from school, 
um, which you just use rub off a uh, pencil. They are a phenomenally good sampling technology for sampling parchment. And to amaze your friends and impress them, you say, well, you know, so I'm going to use a triboelectric device to extract the pigment from this pitch sheet of paper. Yeah, I'm going to rub out some, some pencil. Um, so basically, the process of triboelectrics is the idea that you can rub one surface against another and strip electrons off. And so some of you with hair, I'm sorry, I can't really do this anymore, if you rub a balloon on your head, you know that you can get your hair stuck on end. And that's because you're rubbing electrons off your hair and they're transferring them to the plastic. So that same process is happening here. And what we've discovered is that small molecules, which are basically broken apart, so the damaged molecules lying in the surface of parchment, get wrapped up into the rubbings. And so if you watch it on the screens, you'll see a kind of animation of how we imagine that might be happening. But what was brilliant about this, of course, is this was standard conservation practice. So conservation studios in galleries, in libraries, in archives, all over the world are using this technology. And so all we said to them is, could we please have your waste? So they write to us, and we send them one of these, a box. And the box is very high tech, as you can see. It just contains some tubes to put your waste in, some uh, acid-free paper so you can tip the waste into the tube, and some plastic gloves. And so that's a high tech kit for something. We've sent that out to now over 110 organizations, I don't know how exactly, over 100 organizations. And we've got back 5,000 samples of parchment. So what it's meant is we've been able to sample parchment from across the world without having to go anywhere, just have to post off these boxes. So that's been really, really helpful. Um, and so if we get this much in the bottom of one of those little tubes, can you take one of those tubes out maybe? Dun, 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 dun. They're very small tubes, that's a scale, two scale. Okay, one of those. So if you have that much in the bottom of the tube, we can give you a protein analysis. I'll show that later. And that will tell you what species the parchment is made of. If we're a bit luckier and we get a lot more up to here, we can now, it turns out, extract the DNA as well. And that will, there's more interesting things we can do with that. Okay, so parchment is made from domestic sheep. Right, is it really sheep? So that was the very first question. Because when you read the literature, um, experts, by looking at a sheet of parchment, can identify whether it's calf, sheep, or goat. And they're the main species. We have found, I think, one exotic skin of a deer, but basically we've also found that it's true. Are they mainly sheep? And that's kind of an interesting question because if you talk to a modern day parchment maker, you talk to, um, to Irji, or you talk to Jesse. Jesse, we were in his, we were in his parchment production site in, in America which is basically a small shack in the woods. And he was saying, I never work on sheep, they're just horrible. And the reason is because the skins are so greasy that as you work with the, the skin, the, 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 the lanolin, the grease, sheep grease, just keeps coming out of the parchment. Cowleys, if they do work, they occasionally work with sheep skin, they have, to, they have to start the whole process again, clean everything and start again just on sheep. They can work with calf and goat together because they're not very greasy, but sheep are so greasy, you have to treat them differently. So it's kind of surprising that what we find from Saxel is it's all sheepskin. But in fact, she's right. So this is just a map, and this is not the 5,000 samples. These are the samples where the, 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 the authority from the conservation studio knows where the parchment actually came from. And vast amounts of parchment, we don't know their origin. But you can see in England, a very large amount of sheep <coughs> is being used. Claims. Also in Spain, and you probably know that these are the two most important wool production regions in Europe. The, the wealth of medieval England was built on the sheep, according to the barons. And Spain is where merino sheep came from, that basically ultimately took over the British wool industry. In Italy, are lots of goats, um, uh, and um, some, some sheep, actually all the sheep from Italy are really from Sardinia, because they have a... Uh, um, a sheep milk uh, agriculture. And then as you go to Northern Europe, you see many, many more cattle. So it looks to us that what people are using for parchment is what is locally available, which is, I guess, a <coughs> surprise. And Saxon was right about the sheep. 
Um, and what's been interesting about that is I mentioned how greasy the sheepskin was. This study is worrying about preservation of parchment and has measured the amount of lipid or fat in the skin. And notice two of the skins, which come from 17, uh, the, uh, late 18th century, 1769, 1775, have lots more fat the others. It looks how somehow the method of parchment production might have changed to have less fat in the skin. No, it's simply that the sheep are the fatty ones. <coughs> and more recently, we've avoided using sheepskin as much. So it's sheepskin contain lots of fat. Why? Well, when we look at the, the goat, the, you know, afterwards we might, we might look at see why. Um, and when you start to analyse the species, this is a wonderful book, you may have heard about it. It's just arrived from Italy into the British Library, and there's a big exhibition on Anglo-Saxon manuscripts at the moment in Britain. And this is one of the most famous books that's come in. It's called Codex Amiatinus, and this huge tome, this massive thing, hot, the complete Bible, was found in Italy, and only quite recently it was realised this was made in Northumbria. And it was made by Archbishop Colbrick in about 1720, and taken by him to give to the Pope. And he actually made three of these massive Pandek Bibles. Pandek means it contains all of the, the books of the Old and New Testament. And he actually died on the way. So this actually never reached the Pope. Anyway, so it's made of 500 cards and three of these Bibles, so you can work out how much land was required to raise all of these cards to make uh, the Bible. Except when you do, when you analyze it, it's not cards. So the whole story about this book kind of falls apart. Um, they'd actually use the, the, the amount of land that Colfer had purchased to work out how many cards could be raised. It turns out it's actually sheep and goats, parchment, and it's actually is probably Italian stock. We don't know that for sure yet, which has been brought to Britain. <coughs> um, so one of the interesting things about it as well, one of the one of the one of the claims is that some of the finest parchment is made of uterine animals, uterine skin. Um, and so what Sarah's able to do, because she's a protein specialist, is she can actually analyze these funny proteins which are found in the skin. And what she was able to show was that uterine skin has different levels of some of these proteins. So here is a thing called fetal hemoglobin. So this is the blood carrying molecule which is found in the fetus but not found in the animal. And she was able to demonstrate that all of the uh, calves were actually being killed between about six and eight weeks of age. And Ilaji could confirm that because what he did is he looked at the scrape mark from the skin. So this is the shoulders of the animal, the head is here, the tail is down there. And he looked at the scrape marks and the biological features on the skin. And he was then able to measure the size of the skin and say, yes, these are calves. They're very, very young. And remember that medieval, uh, medieval cows were quite small anyway, so medieval cows were even smaller. So a big shock for us was that it wasn't actually uterine animals, but they're killing calves incredibly young, so six to eight weeks, to make parchment. And Ergy says it's obvious why, because he tried to make parchment from a calf which was a year old, and, and the thing about the skin is it gets so thick, it's good for leather, but it's no good for parchment, because you can't, it's so thick, the calf skin, you can't work it down fine enough. Um, now that's curious, because here's a plot, you can't quite read this, it's a Saxon, Norman, Norman, late medieval, post medieval, so these are animal bones, and the blue is juvenile. So six to eight week animals are definitely juvenile, these are extremely young animals, they're so small, it's kind of hardly worth killing them. And notice, in the Norman period, there's no bones <coughs> found in these juvenile animals. And this particular paper argues that it's our increased wealth in Tudor times and our love for veal, which drives <coughs> the, the slaughter of these very young animals. Except, we know there's vast numbers of these very small animals being killed because they're all turning out in books. So, we don't really now understand the lack of correspondence between what the archaeology is saying from the broken bones and what we're seeing in hundreds and hundreds of books made from very young calves. We don't know where the bones have gone. And this is also now true if you look at things like the Doomsday Survey, because this is the Doomsday Survey which is recording the number of sheep, lots of them, and calf, 
very few, we've got a doomsday scenario, compared to the burn distribution, where we're seeing basically a 50-50 mix. So it's kind of curious that we're having these lines of evidence from archaeology and then lines of evidence from other sources, and they don't kind of match up. We don't really know why that is at the moment. And we can also get some other strange things going on. This is just looking at the skins themselves and looking at their chemistry. And we can analyze from their chemistry what the sheep were eating. And this is looking to see whether they're eating grass or they're eating exotic foods from dry environments. And what you notice is that at the time from 1200s, they eat grass, grass, grass. And suddenly something very strange happens here. And this line kicks up. And it can't be the process of enclosure, which is where the sheep are being managed because the fences are put around them. And it can't be the arrival of fertilizer because enclosure is too early and fertilizer is too late. So talking to colleagues, what they now think what this is, is the arrival in Britain of a thing called Indian corn. Indian corn is seen as a low cost carbohydrate. And you see it first appearing in about the 1840s in the Irish famine, it pops up. And this is coming from America, we think of it as maize. So it's Indian corn is coming in, and the Indian corn has a signal of, of, of a different um, uh, type, and it has these high values for this particular parameter. So this is grass here, Indian corn up here, and we're now finding historical records of them saying they're feeding sheep on Indian corn, even in the Welsh hills in the late uh, 19th century. So this is probably where that signal is. So we're even seeing what the sheep are eating and if we can get the DNA out, we can work out the sex of the animals that's being killed. So here we have a late Anglo-Saxon Bible. We don't have many results yet, but the curious thing is, three of the four that we've got authentication, actually four out of five now, of the ones we could get a sex ID on, they're female. Now remember these are tiny calves. These are six week old female calves that are being killed, so this is DNA sexing, um, which seems very, very odd. Maybe, we don't understand the reason for this, because there's no records that said they were killing very odd, young female calves. Maybe because here's a picture of an Anglo Saxon plow, and you're plowing with four oxen. Um, so these are castrated males typically. Whereas when the horse comes in in the high medieval period, um, there's maybe a switch towards uh, a more daring economy, so you need female animals. So maybe you're killing off young females because you need male animals for traction. Maybe that's it. But this is really weird because we know when this bit was produced. And it was produced in about 970 AD. In 968, uh, is it? I think so, two, two years beforehand. There's a terrible moraine, a terrible cattle plague, and very, very large numbers of cattle dying in England. So imagine you've just had vast numbers of your cows have just died. You're trying to regrow your stocks again. Why on earth would you kill female calves? It makes no sense. And the only explanation we can come up with at the moment is this is a hugely important book. It's a Bible taken by someone called Archbishop Wollstan from Canterbury to York when he becomes the Archbishop of York. And maybe this is such an important book, it's called the York Gospels. It's the book on which every single Archbishop and every uh, uh, single other senior ecclesiastical figure in the York Bishopric swears an oath on when they are invested. Maybe they said, this is such an important book, we have almost no female animals, but we want to use the very best for God, and so we gave the female animals. We have no idea. It's quite an extraordinary finding, but the numbers are very small, so we can't speculate too much yet. We need to <coughs> more So, we can see the animals. The next thing that happens, the skins have come in, they're made of sheep <coughs> in sacks or part of the production site, and the wool puller pulls off the wool and sorts it. <coughs> so he sorts the wool into the wool of different quality. So part of the process of making parchment is it's mainly sheep, as you saw, it's mainly sheep in England, so there's wool on these sheep. Um, and so you want to get the wool off. So one of the interesting questions you can start to ask is what can you learn from parchment about the quality of fleece? And 
the arch so, so the Lord High Chancellor in the House of Lords sits on the wool sack. The <coughs> and the wool sack today is full of wool from animals from all across the Commonwealth. And in fact, we look at those animals from all across the Commonwealth, all by so there's 14 main breeds that have now become the breeds of the world. Twelve of those breeds are British, and the other two are uh, continental European. And so today there are 72 recognized breeds of sheep in New Zealand, but most of them come from animals from the uh, 19th century, middle 19th century, taken out to Australia, New Zealand, to Canada, to North America, to South America. Um, and so this is a wonderful historian, Arlene Power, and she mentions this chap, Bakewell, who's from, from around here, from Midland. And Bakewell was famous for being the first real improver. And so he, he was um, himself quite a showman, and he gets written up as a real showman by some other people who promote his work. And so when you went to visit him in his farm, on one side you'd see a, a field of unimproved animals, on the other side you'd see his Leicester long wolves, beautiful large big animals. Now these things would grow to maturity in two years, rather than the unimproved animals which would grow to maturity in three. So it saved a year. The animals themselves are much bigger, but as Bakewell admits, they're pretty inedible. They have lots of thick, thick layers of fat underneath the skin. Um, but they are seen as the, the coming thing. They're helping to feed a nation as we're, we're, we're starting on these wars with, with the, the French. Um, and everyone starts to breed his Leicester long wolves. And so Eileen Power bemoans the fact that we've lost all of these original breeds because of this vast desire for improvement. And worse than that, we also then get the Merino that come in. King Philip of Spain gives King George the Merino sheep. And there's another, another craze of crossbreeding with Merinos. So these two beasts, the new Leicester Lumber and the Merino, did a terrible disservice to British sheep breed. And so what we would like, one of the things we want to do, this kind of citizen science project, is we want to give out little lenses. We want people to take photographs of parchment and see if they can image the follicle pattern. We'll have a look afterwards on the sheep. And so here we have very coarse hairs with very fine hairs intermixed between it. And that's a typical wild sheep. Um, and then you have the hairy sheep, and finally two to fine walled animals. And the fine walled animals have lost that thick kemp, they have a very fine fleece. And here we have wool prices that I've plotted out in different counties of Britain. This is coming from data from Flemish and Florentine merchants. And you can notice here that, for instance, around Herefordshire, very, very high values, they're darker colours. But next door to it, there's that <coughs> Cheshire now. There's, um, I'd be Shropshire. The value is much lower, and that stays consistently different. Um, and so parts of the country that have no data implies they probably weren't even buying wool from those places because the quality was too low. So we'd be really interested to understand that pricing differential, which actually drove the suspension of monastic orders. They became incredibly efficient industrial businesses based upon the sale of, of wool to, to, to the continent. And see if we can actually track that in the parchment itself. So here's the idea. We're going to be giving out these lenses and ask people to take photographs and then to upload the images of, of the fleeces. And we're going to have an app produced. This is not our app, this is an app that the, 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 the working with, where you can actually then take a photograph um, and record it. And we can start looking at parchment documents from all over the country and start seeing, if we can, start seeing, can we see patterning in the fleets? Can we see differences in the breed type? So the next thing that happens is it goes to lime yard. And lime yard is the process you've probably heard about before, but it's the process where we actually we put the skin into lime and we can strip off the, of the hair. So we've been looking at that. So here's energy in the cold winter in York. He's got his lime uh, baths here. And it's extraordinary when you leave them in lime how readily the hair comes away, and then on the beam, you remove the remaining flesh in the hair. And so he's been looking at the duration of liming, his lime solution, this is five days, 10 days, and 15 days, and how that affects the quality of the parchment. And we can measure, that's a chemical measure, we actually measure the individual proteins using Sarah's proteomics method, so that every time we do an analysis, we can measure how much this index, 
how much damage the protein has seen, and therefore that's a proxy for how many days the skin has been in line. And this is the result you get. So here we have time from 500 AD to the present day. And here we have her, what she calls her quality index. So if it's 100%, it's hardly been in line at all. If it's down at 0%, it's completely it's basically gelatinous ruin. And we've, we can see that there's lots of data, and lots of data is quite scattered. So some very good, and some not so good parts. Of it. What's quite interesting over time, you see almost no change in that range of quality until you get to the 15th century. And suddenly, everything goes down. And here I've plotted it against the, the relative uh, proportions of parchment to paper. And what you see is the arrival of paper production in Britain is a competitive medium to parchment, you can write on parchment or paper, seems to correspond with this first collapse in quality. And it seems to imply that maybe if you leave parchment in, in line for longer, it's easier to work, it becomes weaker. Also, leaving it in line makes the skin look a lot whiter afterwards. So maybe they're trying to compete with paper, but we don't really know. Here we see in Eastern Europe and Bulgaria, the acquisitions of parchment almost stop early because in, in Eastern Europe, paper arrives earlier than it does in Western Europe. The Bodleian Library, basically no more paper acquisitions and the British Library after this point. The Borthwick Library in York continues to acquire parchment documents. The reason for that is because the Borthwick is taking legal documents. And the end of parchment in Britain is really heralded by the arrival of the typewriter. So what happens is legal, legal clerks love writing on parchment. So and as a lawyer, you love cha charging your client. So you, so, you, so you have a legal deed, and you open it, they, they charge by the words. So you have these really long wordy documents written on huge great bits of sheepskin. And that continues and continues and continues. And we really see it pinching out at the beginning of the 20th century when you're no longer need legal clerks because you, you have a title. Um, and so what we then see is improvement. Things get better, 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 better. And suddenly they collapse again. And we don't know why that collapse happens. It could be it's happening in the, sort of the late part of the, 7th, the 18th century, 19th century. It could be the Napoleonic Wars restricting where the animals are coming from. Maybe they're using sheep from the continent. They can't get them anymore, so the quality goes down. And it could be that there's very fatty sheep that Bakewell starts to breed in and around here and um, need to be so much longer in line to get turn that fat into soap, to saponify. So maybe that's the reason. Um, we honestly don't know. And then the quality goes up again. So we don't really understand what's going on here, but we can see these changes in quality. Um, and that's linked to the lining process. The next thing they do is they want to separate out, they sort, the best quality for parchment and then lesser quality for chamois leather or, and also in inky gloves. So they're sorting out the skins in terms of their quality. And so one of the things we've got on the table over there is bad quality skins. Skins that have been attacked by insects and other parasites. And so this Annelise Benoit is really intrigued by. So she's been mapping the incidences in historical records of particular diseases. And so one of the things we're hoping to look for is evidence where you have one of these large mortalities of the use of poorer quality parchment of flea bitten skins. And so we've now seen, for instance, we've got evidence of goat and sheep pox skin. We've also seen evidence of warble fly damage. And one of the fascinating things to us about that is it also tells you about the time of year that these skins are being slaughtered because warble fly enter in the autumn and emerge in the spring. So by looking whether you've got entry and exit holes, um, you actually can say something about when the animals be. Um, but once it's been sorted, and, a good, so, and one, one thing that we've also noticed is you lose that really scuzzy, horrible parchment. So when you go on to the sort of 17th, 18th century, you don't see it anymore. And I assume it's because what's happening is that sorter is only making sure the highest quality skin is good for parchment. And then about 1706, the first law comes along saying that an inspector could go to a parchment making site, and if there are poor quality skins, he can not only find the owner and get money himself, he can also actually take merchandise from the parchment maker. So there's a real incentive for inspectors to find fault. 
and what we've noticed is the legal documents are pretty much faultless after that point. So once you've made the skins and sorted them, you have to stretch them. And so what Ergy has been doing, he is a parchment maker, and so what he does is he does the completely wrong thing with imaging. He takes a piece of parchment, and instead of putting it on a table and having very fancy lighting to light to color, look at all the different colors and the pigments, he just sticks it against the window. Not, not in the window, but against the window. And takes a photograph with the natural light shining behind the parchment. So it would be a pretty bad photograph today, I suspect. And, and then, of course, what it means is if the text is compressed, you can see both sides of the page. But what it also means is you can see, you can see here, the scrape marks left by the knife, the lunella. And we've just got lunella here. And I've never seen one of this. I've seen pictures of these before, but never seen them on. So this is a, an example of new lunella. And there's different styles of these. And what he's intrigued by is he notices that some of the skins are very kind of punchy with scrape marks. Some ones are kind of much more languorous and wavy. And so he thinks we might be able to actually identify, say, in a single book, whether, because a book would be assembled from skins all produced at the same time, whether we have multiple parchment makers or a single parchment maker involved in making. And he's also intrigued by repair process. And he's been noticing that there's been very characteristic selling repairs, and they vary in different markets. They're very beautiful. And these are these are flay cuts. So this is where the skinner has made an arrow, it's like slight, slight cut, and it's got stretched open. And so prior to the, the stretching process, if there are these flay cuts, they'll then be repaired. So when the skin is stretched, they hold together. And there's just a range of different styles. And one of the things that Irs you want to do as part of this project now is actually document all of these different patterns of repair and see if we can say, yeah, this is kind of British from the middle of the 14th century. This is what they were doing in Italy in, in the 12th century. We'll see if that works. Okay, so we've made the parchment. I can stop there. I can talk a little bit about use. It's up to you. Or we can have a look at how we think. So we'll stop or carry on? Carry on. Carry on? Just a little bit, okay. Just a little bit you said, okay. So, the thing then is, so why are you make parchment? You're making parchment so we can use it to make books and, and legal documents. So, here's an interesting example. I showed you that meeting, I showed you the picture from the meeting in Oxford. Where we looked at a book um, from the 12th century produced in Canterbury. And so in Canterbury, here are the city of Canterbury, here's the walls of the city. There's a Canterbury Cathedral. And you have actually two sites of parchment production in Canterbury. You have the cathedral production site at Christchurch. And you also have the Abbey of St. Augustine's outside. And these are the two most, um, of two of the most active scriptoria in the 12th century. And so we're kind of really intrigued <coughs> by how these places actually work. And so by analyzing this one book, we're beginning to, begin to get some clues. So one of the things about um, parchment is, of course, you have a hairy side, where it's like hair is, and a fresh side. And when you prepare parchment, however you prepare it, the, the, the flesh side is always slightly different in opacity of translucency from the hair side. So if you want to make parchment really nice, you keep the hair sides together and the flesh sides together so that when you open the page, you, you don't notice those differences. And in in Christchurch Canterbury, they impose a pattern which we call the continental pattern of hair to hair, flesh to flesh quite early. In St. Augustine's, they seem to be much more mixing and matching with their hair and flesh. This is our book. This is the whole book taken apart. Here are the oak boards, and you can saw some transampolum for, for um, the thrash from the kind of woodboy beetle. And, and then we have a, an outer covering of the oak boards. And then here are the choirs. So these are the folded groups of pages. They're numbered in Roman numerals here. Um, so what we see is calf and sheep, flesh to flesh. So it's a very curious structure. So we've got a total of five different animals used to make this book. We thought there was only one, but it's five. Um, and so we start off, and you can see it's calf, sheep, calf, sheep, calf, sheep. And then it changes. Oh, and, by the, and someone folded the pages wrong, because presumably they stacked them together. And you look at four, <coughs> it goes, so this is calf sheep, this is sheep calf. 
You know it's the wrong way around. So they fold that one the wrong way around. They didn't notice at the time. And then you have this one which is all calf. And then it's three calf to one sheep. And then it's two calf and some goat. Maybe the goat. We rarely see goat in Britain. And then it changes. Now, we didn't know this. We got, that's the result that we got. But the, but the scribal scholar who looked at the writing style, style said, oh, at that point, there's a change in the main scribe. Remember, this is a gloss Luke, so this is the text of Luke in the middle. That's written by the main scribe. And there's actually, actually five other people that write the glossing. But the main scribe changes. And once the main scribe changes, the first chance the new scribe has, he's actually <coughs> using the structure, which is the old calf sheep, calf sheep because it was presumably made for the initial scribe, and then the second scribe took over. But the second scribe, he only gets to use sheep. So there seems to be something going on here. And if you look at the pricing, calf is always worth more than sheep. So it looks that this scribe has access to better quality materials than this scribe. And to my mind, it looks to me like this, the good scribe, um, and in fact, the, the scribal scholar says he is a better scribe. So the good scribe realizes he's not going to complete the book. <coughs> so he does use up all of his casting. And then the second scribe has access only to sheepskin. And in fact, when we measure the quality of the sheepskin, it goes down. So it's not only sheepskin, it gets, the second scribe gets access to worse quality sheepskin. Now, one of my colleagues, who's a biblical scholar, spotted this goat. That's an unusual thing. We've only found one other document in Britain, which is authentically British, which has goat. So this is really weird to find goat skin. Um, and he, he, he disagrees with another of my colleagues. He says, well, of course, this is the Gospel of Luke. And as you know, Matthew, yeah, I know. there's only one mention of goat in the Gospel of Luke. Yeah, I, I kind of knew that, really. <laughs> um, and it's in the story of the prodigal son. And in the story of the prodigal son, that the, the son of the state of heaven says to his father, well, you know, why are you slaughtering the calf for my, for my errant brother when you never even gave me a kid to make merry with my son? And that, that text is in this choir. So is that a scribal joke? We don't know. But it's kind of pretty curious. Right? Um, Another thing that we've been able to find, uh, this, is really, this is really reported very soon in the press, is um, that we have found in the teeth of a nun in Germany <laughs> um, the presence of this very, very fine particles, intensely blue. And, and this is um, uh, the pigment known as a lapis lazuli. And, and so it's very, very fine and disseminated. And the, the medieval scholar that looks at this thinks that probably this nun was actually involved in the illumination. And so she licked her brush and it got caught in her teeth. And then because she hadn't got very good dental hygiene, she grew dental calculus plaque, which calcified in her teeth, and trapped these pigments inside. So and that's, we, I, we don't really think so much about the people at the moment. We think about the craftspeople from the evidence they left in the craft. But it would be interesting to think maybe in the future we might be able to link the skeletons of scribes and, and particularly illuminators back to objects. Sadly, from this particular convent, we have no text. That could be a problem, so we have no answers to that. Emma Dee is interested in bindings, and so she said to us, well, could you analyze some of the bindings from a very famous site called, called um, uh, Clairvaux, uh, it's now held in Troy, Abbey Clairvaux, is the home of Bernard of Clouveau, the founding, the founder of the Cistercian movement. Anyway, so we had looked at a few bindings, and these are quite early bindings, which were made of deer skin. And the book we looked at from 1160s, so that was 9th century, 1160s deer skin. LED sent us some samples from this foundational Cistercian Abbey, and <coughs> they're sealed. And the more we looked at Cistercian documents, they're all seal skin. So this was a big shock. I mean, what's going on with seal skin? But it looks like something going on here to do with the fact that as a Cistercian, the Cistercians were kind of real pyramid scheme. You have one Cistercian uh, abbey had these daughter abbeys, the daughter abbeys had granddaughter abbeys as well, and so they expanded very, very rapidly. 
And it looks to us that the style of binding was being taught by master binders and abbeys and getting copied. And they're using sealskin. Now we don't know why they're using seal, sealskin. We have a suspicion based on work done by a colleague of mine, James Barrett, from the University of Cambridge, who's been looking at ivory, that there was a very strong coincidence between the arrival of this sealskin and the settlement of Icelandic uh, settlers on Greenland. And you've probably heard about this Greenland colony that fails. And what James has been showing in a lovely paper recently published was that you get the rise of Islam uh, basically, you're cutting off Europe from its African source of ivory. And so you get the establishment of a colony. Well, first of all, you wipe out all of the, the warrants in, um, around the Norwegian coastline in, in, in Iceland. They all go very quickly. But there are large colonies of warrants in Greenland. And he sees the shipment amongst all the ivory that seems to be coming to medieval Europe appears to be coming from the Greenlandic settlement. Those same Greenlandic settlers, settlers, they're hunting the wars in the summer. In the winter, they're hunting seals. And so we're suspecting that there may be, this is seal skin coming from Greenland, but we can't <coughs> prove it yet. And we think it's, again, an sort of example of conspicuous consumption. You use the most exotic, fancy things you can. And certainly the, the, the life of Bernard of Clure himself, his book is bound in seal skin. So maybe that's where the seal skin from. Um, so that's use. And then finally, uh, if you touch the book, you leave a mark. And so Matthew has been analyzing his New York Gospel, see how dirty it is? <coughs> and what he found was we analyzed a few pages. And the page, the oath page, which is the page which is being kissed by the bishops as part of their oath, has got more human DNA on it than any other page, even the page which has been handled by conservatives. So what we're seeing here is people handling a book have left behind their DNA on the book. And by looking at the damage pattern of the DNA, I don't even know what this means, but if you have a damage pattern that looks like a smiley face, that means this DNA is probably old. So this is suggesting that the DNA, the human DNA on this book is probably old DNA. And then what Matthew can do is he can look at the bacteria on that book, and the bacteria on that book, he can, he can say, well, here we have, um, the bacteria from the lid in the mouth, over there, bacteria from human feces over here, and then bacteria from the nose and skin over here. And what you can see is that the, 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 the pattern of bacteria found on the folia are the same as found in nose and skin. So this is talking about handling the document. So not only have we left behind the DNA of the people that have left behind their oaths on the document, they've also left behind the bacteria from their skin or their nose document. And we don't know what this really means yet, but it's kind of intriguing and it might tell us something about the use history of the document. So it's really kind of quite quite, quite surprising. And I, I think I'll stop there, I've talked enough. Because the last thing we want to try and do, which is less relevant to you, is try and work then with conservators to see how we can use this knowledge to help conserve parchments from the past. But, but the real story then is, don't think about the words on the page. Think about the animal skin and think about all the different ways that the parchment is telling us a story about those animals and the people that turn them into, into parchment. And what we're hoping to learn as we analyze more of this is can we understand things about livestock management practices? What we're hoping to find, for instance, is can we look at the maternal and paternal inheritance of these animals? Can we see do they all have the same mothers or are there diverse groups of animals? And how many male animals are there being used to raise these things? Are, are there, is it is a single, single bull or a single ram? Or is it very, very mixed? How far away are they drawing in these animals to produce the parchment? And how does that change over time? And to what extent do we see the parchment itself being moved or animals being moved? Can we see the process of improvement? Can we see the way that Bakewell, who is breeding in and in and in, i.e. the idea of line breeding, the breeds of type. Can we see when that first starts? You've heard this text saying the Cistercians are actually improving their flocks. Can we see evidence of that? So what we're hoping in this project over the next five years is to actually learn a lot about the livestock production and craft and how this skin that we see around us 
is turned into not leather, but butter. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> of course, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Fascinating talk. Any any questions? Any thoughts? Yeah, Brent. The, the two scribes who were yeah. doing the, the Bible there. When the second one came, would they have bought their own skins? And so was he? Was he? Yeah, he was. So that's a great question. We have no idea about this. I mean, we don't know the kind of. To what extent the scribes have any control? So one of the things that's been fun to talk to is talking to the scribe. So there is the royal scribe, the person that takes all the documents from uh, the palace, and, and, and then you know any of these documents are magical and things. And uh, yeah, he, he was telling me just how important the surface quality is, and he gets deeply frustrated because you know, you know people just give him parchment. He says, I know he has to work very hard on the parchment to make the surface nap right for the particular kinds of writing that he's doing. So the suspicion is that you know, the scribes really cared about what they're working on, and there's been, someone has told me, and I can't find the source, the, the, the scribe would choose to write on the skin of female animals more than male animals. I mean, how would they know? You know but, um, but obviously, I guess if you work so much of these materials, and of course one of the things about this collection here is it's trying to record lost craft skills. But those skills, when you're working with the material day in, day out, um, it probably really matters to you. Now, whether, I mean, Python's quite light. Whether you brought it with you, I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe they did. Um, and one of the things we want to find out, what's intriguing about Canterbury, when we saw that structure of car sheet, car sheet, we thought it was utterly unique. We've now analyzed a, a range of other uh, scriptoria that don't have it. So it does appear to be fairly unique to that book. But then, we were given access to the body, and we're hoping now in, uh, in early January to look at some of the collections in Cambridge. We looked at other texts produced in country at the same time. And a lot of them seem to be doing exactly the same thing. It's car sheet, car sheet, car sheet. So the Matthew, which is equivalent to the Luke, the, the gloss Matthew, this was, this was Luke marked for the letter A, so it was the first one in the library. And the Matthew marked the letter A is all car. So Luke is not quite as good as Matthew. Um, but a lot of other documents have got this mix of calf and sheep. And again, another question we've got is, so if you have a perception about the value, the gloss looks are working text. They're not the very finest material, like the York Gospel. So the very finest material probably gets the very best parchment. And maybe that's why you have young female calves, even after a major catastrophe when most animals have died. A working document you use as good as you've got. Um, and then maybe, and certainly a lot of, well, the, I wanted to say about the legal text. So the legal texts are invariably written are all sheep. Now, why are they all sheep? Well, there's a chap called Archbishop Richard, and he writes a dialogue on the chancery in the 13th century. So he said, I'm working on the terms, and I think I should explain to them how the chancery works. And in this text, he, he gives lots of information about how, how it operates. One of the things he says is, when you write legal documents, always write them on sheepskin. And he says, because sheep will not take an erasure. Now what it is, is because remember I talked about how sheep have got that nasty, that, that they're very greasy and fatty. The reason the sheep's been so horrible to work with is very obvious. We'll look at the sheep goat, and they'll look at the hair. You'll see it's fantastic, fantastic. Because it's a cross between the sheep and the goat, it has a part of the fleece, part of the skin on it, which has got a sheep fleece on it, and part of it's got a goat hair on it. It's an extraordinary skin. Now the goat hair is much coarser. There's many f fewer hairs. And Think about the lanolin, you know, the, 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 the natural world. All of the hairs on our heads are naturally, um, <coughs> uh, they have a natural oil coating on them. If you have lots and lots of fine hairs, you have lots of little fatty, sebaceous glands under the skin. And the problem then with sheep with lots of fine hair, you have so many sebaceous glands, you have almost a layer under the skin of fat. And that's why the parchment makers hate it, because the fat just keeps coming out of the skin. There's so much fat in the skin because the hairs are so fine. Now, if you have a layer of skin with a fat layer in the middle, it's like kind of like tear along here in a line of weakness. And so what happens if you take a sheepskin, and what they meant by erasure in those days is you physically rub away the surface. If you rub away the surface of sheepskin, you delaminate it, you just strip off that top layer. So if you've written on the surface and try and rub it off, it's very obvious. Whereas goat and calf skin, because it's got a very dense weave of collagen, you can erase away, completely remove the old text, remove the, you know, the eight of 80,000, 10 to 80, you know, whatever, you can change the name of the owner of the piece of land. 
So, that, so what Bar Archbishop Richard says is this anti-fraud mechanism automatically be built into sheepskin means you should work on sheepskin. <coughs> and although more modern sheepskin parchments, they've got rid of that problem, they've got they've delaminated it, they split the skin, they still work on sheep. So I wonder if that tradition gets locked in very, very early. Um, yeah, sorry. I think I didn't ask the question, but I got it. An early, <laughs> early PDF then? Sorry? Early PDF files. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. exactly, yeah. Isn't it? I mean, it's curious. I mean, it's, and we, we just, we've, we've analysed so many archival documents now in Britain, it's like, <coughs> 99.97% sheep. Uh, yeah. Any more questions? I really enjoyed the paper. I thought it was really in the spirit of the festival, which yeah. is all about kind of celebrating the humanities and lots of different approaches yeah. to studying things. Do you think leather in particular offers an opportunity for people who are historians, archaeologists, scientists yeah, I mean, to come together and work on stuff? Absolutely, because it's one of those curious areas where, first of all, I mean, the craft is so important. And, and, and we, have, we have very few craftspeople, but I'll clearly the craft is telling us about how the stuff is being made. And then the historians understand about, so I, have, I assume work on, on, on the legality of parchment production, and it's incredibly complicated legal structure gets set up. Um, and then you have, of course, the paleographers that can read the scribal styles. Um, they don't understand the meaning of the text, which I don't understand, so I can't read medieval Latin. And, and you really need that combination of skills. No one person can really address these questions. That's why I really kind of like this project, because everyone is kind of an equal partner in the project. So yeah, so it very much is that kind of, that branching, you know, overarching kind of project that needs these very skills. So you know, we have a series of really f horrible flea bit skins over there, but then Annelise Benoit, who's a veterinarian, loves that stuff, because she <laughs> likes sheep pathogens, and she can tell you about which particular season of the year, which particular sheep pathogen impacts, which is useful for us, because then it will tell us when, when the animals are being slaughtered. So yeah, it's a, it's a real combination of different skills that require. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, should we give Matthew another round of applause? Thank you very much. As I said, if you could do one of the forms, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And um, these are quite a bit. And so on this table, I've got, I've got some more stuff to show you. Well, no, yeah. So, this, <laughs> so I asked them to get it out to me, and we're going to pass it around. We'll come to the table. So this is a. It's called, it's called a. Shadow. Shout. So this is a sheep goat hybrid. I, mean, I, I, I get that's it, pretty complicated. But it's a wonderful illustration because you've got a sheep fleece here and a goat fleece there. And I'm really intrigued about this because you and firstly you can see the very difference in the, in the hair, the quality of the hair on the skin. And that's explaining why the, you have this very different quality in the parchment that's produced. And there's actually then there's quite a diet. The second half of that is the kind of diet. And then the other thing on this table are these wonderful diseases. <laughs> um, and we're hoping to spot these and look at the gene genetic version, and then of course this is the this is one of the parts of nine. We so have, have a look at this extraordinary mm -hmm. And we're going to sample it to work oh, out shit. does it molecularly look more like a goat or a sheep? A sheep. That's a sheep goat, yes. And a goat sheep is a key. This is a sheep goat. So you can see it's got lovely sheep skin there. Not sheep skin there. So this is one animal? Or it's one animal, yeah. It was an experiment by Oxford. Is it Cambridge University? Cambridge University in 1985. Yeah, with the memory sick of Yeah, I don't know what I'm talking about. The goat's hair seems to be very soft for a goat. Ah, maybe, okay, that's right. Isn't that weird? So we want to know, what did it think it was in the molecular? So we can analyze the whole of the skin and see if there's seed molecules or goat or a mix of But it's so that that is the kind of fine hair that you get, which makes for bad parchment. And this is the coarse hair, which makes for good parchment. So they've made it these people. I was really intrigued to destroy the whole carcass, and then they said, no, we want to keep it for the for the the, the, you know, for the, the leather work is cut it cut it in half, hand in half. They will obviously live to a reasonable life because it's fairly nice skin. I mean, a lot of these animals, they, they obviously don't live much beyond birth, but this one has to die. And obviously not, uh, not, to do, not to do with this experiment. But in fact, you may have heard in the press kind of a couple of years ago that a, a geep turned up. I think it was an accidental geep. <laughs> Which I guess is where I am.